everyone, and welcome to episode 196 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Well, this weekend, many of us are going to witness the coronation of King Charles III. And a coronation is something that most of us have not experienced in our lifetime. So this is going to be an exciting time for all of us. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to go through all of the medieval English kings from the conquest to the end of the Middle Ages and tell you what I think is memorable about each one, because I think we often don't go through them one by one. So you'll get to see today the connection between each English king from the Norman Conquest until the Tudor period. And that's coming up right after this. So this seems like a good time to revisit all of the English kings, to remember them for the things that they accomplished or perhaps didn't accomplish. I just want to say that I think that History Hit did a similar article about this, but since I haven't read that article, you're going to be getting just my thoughts on what I think is memorable about each of these kings. So here we go. There are 19 of them, and I'm going to be giving you just brief notes on each one so we can see history unfolding over about five centuries I'm not going to be talking about the early English kings, the ones before 1066, because first of all, there are a whole lot of them. Secondly, a lot of them are called Ethel something. And thirdly, because Mark Morris has already really done that extremely well in his book called The Anglo-Saxons. So if you are interested in early English kingship, I would suggest that you listen to my podcast with Mark Morris and also read his book. But I know the kings after 1066 a lot better. So that's what we're going with today. So, of course, the first king we're going to be talking about is William the Conqueror. So he arrived in England in 1066 from Normandy. When he arrived, he face planted on the beach, which is probably an inauspicious start, but <laughs> but things turned out well for him in the end. You can see the story of this happening on the Bayeux Tapestry if you choose to, the unfolding of the battle. The Battle of Hastings seemed to involve a faint in that William didn't pass out, but he pretended he was running away, lured Harold's army down off of their position of strength, at which point William could wipe all of the English people out and take over the kingdom. William did a lot of memorable things in his reign. He reigned until 1087. Some of the things that he is known for was the harrowing of the North, which was an absolutely terrible time for the people in Northern England who were not super keen on having William the Conqueror conquer their land. So that was a memorable thing, obviously a very terrible time for the people in the North of England. William is also known for his extensive castle building. So there are many castles still in England that have his imprint. They are the square castles that you see in England. A really important one, the one at the heart of London, is the White Tower, which was built in 1067, I believe, so shortly after the conquest. Windsor Castle, Rochester Castle, a lot of these were built in the time of William the Conqueror. So his reign was obviously very important. He brought the French language over, and that became the beginning of Middle English when French started to blend with English. Succeeding him, we have William II, or William Rufus, who ruled from 1087 to 1100, so only about 13 years. Nobody really has much to say about him that was fantastic. He seems to have been kind of a temperamental guy, which is probably why he was very likely assassinated. He died in a hunting incident, a quote-unquote accident, in which he was shot by an arrow. And at which point, everybody left him there in the woods, as far as we know, and rushed to get the next king crowned who was the younger brother, Henry I. Henry I ruled for much longer, from 1100 to 1135. He had loads of kids, most of them illegitimate. He had over 20 kids, which is impressive for anyone. <laughs> I mean, not least a king. I don't know if this is a good thing or not for most kings. We know that French kings used to distribute their lands among their legitimate heirs, at least, and that caused a whole lot of problems. But it seems that Henry I was able to distribute ranks amongst his illegitimate heirs and allow them to work for him in ways that were very useful to the kingdom. That said, he only had one legitimate heir, and that was Matilda, his son, William Etheling was killed in the White Ship Disaster when a whole bunch of English nobles went down off the coast of France. 
in what people have called the medieval Titanic. And I did a podcast with Charles Spencer about the white ship disaster, if you are interested in learning more about that. But that left Matilda as the heir to the throne. Everyone swore that they were going to recognize Matilda when Henry died. And of course, that isn't what happened. We'll get to that in just a second. Henry I was really concerned with justice in the kingdom. He really wanted to make sure that things were running well. And so he is sometimes called the Lion of Justice. I believe it's Henry I that is the one who died of a surfeit of eels. So he wasn't supposed to eat so many eels or not at that time. John Wyatt Greenlee, when he was on the podcast, argues that this is lampreys, not eels. Either way, Henry died. And instead of Matilda taking over... In 1135, her cousin Stephen rushed to Westminster Abbey and got himself crowned instead. I believe Helen Castor, when she was on talking about she-wolves, oh, this many years ago, mentioned that Matilda was also pregnant on the continent. So this was really underhanded of Stephen to get there first, but he did. So the next king in 1135 until 1154 was King Stephen. And It's interesting when you think about it because people supported King Stephen being king because they thought he would be better at it as a man. And as it turned out, Stephen was not a very good king. And Matilda kept trying to exercise her rights and become queen. So this threw all of England into the anarchy for people give different estimates of how long, but the longest is 19 years a 19-year anarchy, because Stephen was not a great ruler. So half the people sort of cleaved to Stephen because he was the anointed king, and the other half respected their oaths to Matilda and probably recognized her strength. And that really didn't turn out well for the kingdom. They were torn in two for the better part of two decades. Stephen was not a really great king. He is remembered in part for threatening to throw A baby William Marshall, I think he was something like five years old, at the walls of his dad's castle in a mangonel in order to get the Marshall's dad to surrender. It didn't work because the Marshall's dad yelled down that he had the hammer and anvils to make more and better sons. (laughs) But it's a great story nonetheless. So in the end, Stephen was forced to recognize Matilda's son, Henry, as the heir to the throne when he died, instead of Stephen's own son becoming the next king. And sure enough, Henry II, the first Plantagenet king, came to the throne in 1154 when Stephen died, and he ruled for quite a long time. He ruled until 1189. Henry II is a very interesting figure. He's remembered for a whole lot of things. One of them, perhaps the most important in my mind, is being the father of the devil's brood. So Henry was lucky enough when he was still a prince to have married a massively wealthy heiress who was also the former Queen of France, who is, of course, Eleanor of Aquitaine. And the two of them had many children together. Henry kind of followed the example of previous French kings where he tried to give his sons each some control over some land to keep them happy while he was still ruling because he ruled for quite a long time. And of course, it's made absolutely no one happy. He had Henry the Young King, who he was giving some power to. He had Geoffrey, who he made Duke of Brittany. He had Richard, who he made Duke Aquitaine. Eleanor's favorite, in charge of her lands. And then, of course, we have John Lackland, who is their son, who had absolutely no land and probably resented that forever, which might explain a lot of things. Henry II is also known as being somebody who wanted to pull the law together. He really was offended by the fact that the church and state had separate laws. So he supported the election of his friend Thomas Beckett to become the Archbishop of Canterbury, hoping that he would get him on his side to help with these legal reforms. As it turned out, they butted heads completely, which led to the martyrdom of Thomas Beckett and Henry having to apologize for it on his knees at Canterbury Cathedral. So Henry had a very spicy reign, let's say. He was always fighting against somebody. His sons were always in rebellion against him. And at the moment that he died, he was fighting against a few of his sons. And I believe he is the king who ended up on his deathbed saying, shame on a conquered king. This is what happens, I suppose, when you are the father of the devil's brood. This family was said to have been descended from Melusine. And if you're interested in that story, I would recommend you listen to my podcast with Christine Morgan about that. 
So the next king taking over from his dad is Richard the First, Richard the Lionheart, in 1189, and he ruled until 1199. Richard didn't expect to be king, but he had a few brothers who died before him, and that cleared the way to the throne for him. We know that Richard the Lionheart is probably somebody that you know pretty well. His statue is outside of Parliament in England. He is the one who is a crusader king, probably only spent about six months in England, people estimate. He was the favorite of Eleanor of Aquitaine. He was always very dashing. He had his dad's looks. He had his mom's culture. He was involved in the Siege of Acre, or Acre, where he is also said to have performed an absolutely brutal massacre of prisoners. So he is also remembered for that. We shouldn't, shall I say, lionize him too much. He was a person who had all sorts of depths to him, so we shouldn't give him the crown of a saint. He already had a crown, so he doesn't need a saintly crown anyway. So Richard was known for being very powerful and very charismatic. He also was rash in the way he spoke to people, which is how he ended up being imprisoned on his way back from crusade. And he stayed in prison for quite a long time. He was ransomed by the English people for a lot of money, a king's ransom. Eventually he was released, but he died from gangrene when he was shot by a crossbow bolt. Still a relatively young man. And unfortunately, that cleared the path for his youngest brother, John Lackland, who, unlike his brothers, hadn't had experience ruling a certain area. He was spoiled. He was greedy. He was liked by almost nobody, (laughs) except for perhaps the King of France, with whom he worked to keep Richard in prison for as long as he could. There is a reason that no other English kings have been named John (laughs) since then. This is the guy who is in the Robin Hood legend. And I kind of love the fact that he has a song about him in that Robin Hood, the Fox version from Disney that sings about what a terrible king he was, because that is something that would burn John's behind forever. So it, it kind of makes me smile that that is a thing. In fact, John is responsible, it is said, for the starvation of a lady called Maud de Brouse and her son. Maud apparently spoke out of turn and said out loud where people could hear that John was responsible for the murder of his nephew, Arthur, who would have been king instead of him. Did John murder Arthur? Probably. Were you supposed to say it out loud? No. (laughs) So John is known for being a terrible king. He's kind of earned that. He was not very kind to people. And this is why his barons rose up against him and forced him to put his seal to Magna Carta. John is also responsible for his kingdom being under papal interdict for a long time. So people would remember him as being a king who kept them from being able to perform their religious rites because of his beef with the pope. So it's not just people who are thinking of the Robin Hood legend who think of King John as being terrible. I believe one chronicler said, and I can't remember which podcast I quoted this on, but that hell was made worse because John was in it. So that's King John for you. John had a son named Henry who became king at the age of nine. So in 1216, Henry III became king and he ruled for a very long time, as you might imagine, coming to the throne at age nine. Still, he must have been very healthy because he ruled until 1272. Henry also, like his dad, got into trouble with the barons a few times. And he was even captured by barons who were in rebellion against him, led by Simon de Montfort. And these rebellions kept him busy for a whole bunch of his reign. Something that is relevant to us today is like John, whose baron's rebellions led to Magna Carta, which had some serious impact on English law, although not as much as people tend to think today. Henry had to capitulate to Simon de Montfort and the rebels, which was the beginning of the English House of Commons. So he is an important figure in a way because of the fact that he lost (laughs) some battles. But Henry III is also important in the context of the current coronation because Henry III was really into Edward the Confessor, who was buried in Westminster Abbey, and Henry wanted to have a better place for Edward to rest. So he facilitated the reconstruction of Westminster Abbey at immense cost. According to the Abbey, 
1245, Henry started construction or reconstruction on Westminster Abbey by demolishing what was there and rebuilding in the Gothic style at a cost of 45,000 pounds, which is about $15 million today. So when you see King Charles III going into Westminster Abbey, it looks the way it looks today in part, in large part, because of the efforts of Henry III. And because Henry III was super into Edward the Confessor, he named his son Edward. And Edward I is a very memorable king, for better and for worse. In terms of the United Kingdom, he is probably not going to be everybody's favorite king because Edward I, who ruled from 1272 to 1307, is the one who is called the Hammer of the Scots. He is the one who conquered Wales. He's the one who set up the title Prince of Wales, so the current king. Charles III was formerly Prince of Wales. This is a title that was created by Edward I in his conquest of Wales. So this is a title that, you know, the Welsh are still not very comfortable with because of the way that it was established. Edward is also known as Longshanks because he had very long legs. He was a tall dude. And that is part of the way he is remembered. Edward is a contradiction in a lot of ways because he was... Somebody who was raised through a whole bunch of rebellions under the rule of his father. He also is somebody who was extremely militant in that he was conquering Wales. He was attempting to conquer Scotland, although he died before that was accomplished. He also was very ruthless in that he is the king who expelled all of the Jews from England in the late 13th century. And at the same time, Edward was an extremely devoted father and husband. He had a whole lot of children. Kelsey Wilson Lee talks us through that on her episode of the podcast, Daughters of Chivalry. But Edward also was super devoted to his wife. They married as teens. And when she died, he's the one who set up the Eleanor Crosses, which you can still find in England. He really grieved this wife. And it's really interesting. It shows that human nature of these divine kings, right, where you can be such a ruthless ruler, but also a devoted father and husband. By the way, Edward was married to Eleanor of Castile. Their son was named Alfonso, and if he'd lived, then England would have had next a King Alfonso, which I always think is very interesting. Instead, Edward I died, still trying to subjugate the Scots, and Edward II became king at that point in 1307, and he ruled until 1327 when he was forcibly removed from the throne. Edward II is not known for his kingship unless we're thinking about his kingship in negative terms. He was somebody who is well known for having less interest in ruling than he did in partying, and some people said digging ditches. He was much more of a simple dude. He did not have any interest in the same sort of military campaigns that his dad did. Instead, he wanted to party and he wanted to hang out with his favorites. Edward was very generous with his favorites. And this can be a problem if you are also a lord and you believe that some of the things that are given to the favorites should be given to you. So Edward had a couple of favorites in his lifetime, Pierce Gaveston being the first one who had a very bad end. But Edward didn't learn anything from this because he immediately had another favorite named Hugh de Spencer, who also had a very bad end because of the way that Edward both lavished gifts and attention on him and also allowed him to have way too much influence over his rule. So Edward was known as a bad king. <laughs> he was not well liked by anybody. And one of the people that he scorned was his wife, Isabella, who was Princess of France, and this was a very bad idea. So, of course, Isabella outfoxed him. She used her French power to overthrow him and set her son, their son, on the throne to become Edward III. So Edward II was deposed in 1327. He was imprisoned. He is the one who people say was killed by uh, having a red-hot poker shoved in his rectum. This is extremely unlikely to have been what happened to him. He probably starved to death. He probably did not escape. He probably was not killed by a red-hot poker. He probably was just starved to death in captivity. Edward III was the next king, the teenage son of Edward II and Isabella of France. He ruled from 1327 to 1377, so a very long rule and a very successful rule in medieval terms. 
He was uncomfortable with the way he came to the throne, but he was also much better at kingship than his dad was. Edward III was the father of the Black Prince, who was a very successful military hero. Edward was also the founder of the Order of the Garter, which is still one of the elite orders in England, an order of knighthood. King Charles III and Prince William are both members of the Order of the Garter. This was an order that was established to help the knights of England to live up to the ideals of Arthurian knights, the knights of the round table. Whether they did or not, I will leave that up to you, but that was the intent behind the Order of the Garter. Edward III was a king during the Black Death, so that is an important moment in his reign. He also started the Hundred Years' War in the name of his mother, who was, as we have just said, a princess of France. So he believed that he should be the next ruler of France when there was no direct heir to the throne of France. He decided he was going to take that over, starting a hundred-year conflict. Was that a great thing? Again, I'm going to leave that up to you. But at the time, the English people thought this was a great idea, expensive but potentially a very good idea, allowing them to get back a lot of the land in France that had been lost by King John. Edward III was also responsible for the English dominance in archery. At the time, it came in really handy over the course of the Hundred Years' War. Edward had decreed that every able-bodied man was supposed to be practicing archery on Sundays, which gave him an army when he needed it of very successful and competent archers. So this forethought that he had really came in handy in the rule of somebody who's coming up very soon. So Edward III was known as one of England's most successful kings. He was well-beloved at the time. He is still remembered well as being a successful king, at least in medieval terms. He was supposed to have been succeeded by his son Edward, the Black Prince, but of course the Black Prince died before Edward III did, which left his son, the Black Prince's son, Richard II, to become king. I think he was around age nine in 1377. And Richard ruled from 1377 to 1399. As somebody who was raised as a prince who was given the throne of England and told he was eventually going to get the throne of France, as a child, he really believed in his divine right. He really believed he was supposed to be there. And that didn't make him everybody's friend. Richard needs to be credited, I think, for having the courage to stand in front of the rebels in the Peasants' Revolt and stand up to them and listen to them because he was only 14 at that time. And perhaps he had that overconfidence that he was ruling by divine right and that no harm was going to come to him. I want to give him credit for that bravery at the same time as saying afterwards, after the rebels dispersed, Richard had said they were going to be safe. And of course, Richard came down on them very hard. So I don't want to give him props for that, for (laughs) breaking his promises or for being ruthless. But I do think as a 14-year-old, that would have taken some courage to stand in front of rebels and listen to them, at least pretend to listen to them. Richard wasn't all that interested in pursuing the Hundred Years' War. He was more interested in the arts. He was more interested in things like fashion. There is a picture of him being read to by Chaucer, whether this is based on life or not, I don't know. But this is an interesting picture and a very gorgeous one. It's got lots of beautiful color and gilt, but Richard's face is not visible in this picture anymore, which is interesting. Might have been because of the way that Richard ended his reign. What happened was Richard decided he was going to be both greedy and unkind to his cousin Henry, who was the son of John of Gaunt. Henry got into a dispute, and instead of Richard having his back, he exiled Henry. And when John of Gaunt died, Richard also disinherited Henry. So he was really unkind to Henry. I'm not sure what the animosity was, or if Richard was just flexing his power, perhaps, because he felt untouchable. Well, this was a fatal mistake because Henry came back from his exile and was welcomed by the English people. And he said he just wanted his inheritance back. And then when he got there, he said, well, everyone thinks I should be king anyway. And they did because Henry was the complete opposite of Richard. They were the same age. But while Richard was thought of as being effete 
and ineffectual and not presenting the kingdom with an heir, Henry was blooded in military conflict. He was a father already, so he, you know, proved that he could have heirs. He was just thought of as being a better king material. So when he came back to England, he was welcomed and he was placed on the throne. So Richard II lost his kingdom in 1399, and he remained in prison, where he probably starved to death, much like Edward II. So Henry IV has come to the kingdom. He has been welcomed. He has taken over from his cousin, imprisoned and murdered his cousin. He rules for a relatively short time, 1399 to 1413. And during that time, he never gets any peace. He is constantly trying to find ways to pay the people that helped place him on the throne, notably the Percy family. He is always trying to keep the Welsh from rebelling, the Welsh not lying down after the conquest by Edward I. They are still trying to assert their independence, especially under the leadership of Owen Glendower, who was a Welsh prince, always trying to push back against Henry. Things came to a head at the Battle of Shrewsbury at one point in Henry's reign. And I mention this particular battle because this was a rebellion by Henry Hotspur Percy. So if, again, if you read Shakespeare, Hotspur is in Henry IV. This is the battle where Hotspur meets his end. And also, not in Shakespeare, the future Henry V gets an arrow in the face, which has to be removed by gruesome means which is something that I talked about on previous podcasts as well. So Henry IV never sat easily on the throne, made for a couple of interesting Shakespeare plays. But I don't know in quiet moments if Henry IV was very happy that he had actually usurped the throne because it wasn't easy for him to keep it. When he died in 1413 of illness, his son Henry V took over. And Henry V was a very serious dude. He was not much of a partier, but the thing he was serious about, for the most part, was taking up this war with France. And I'm not sure why this was so important to him specifically, but he decided he was going to take up this fight in France and really push it. So he had a lot of campaigns in France. The most famous battle that he was a part of was Agincourt, This is one in which he was outnumbered, his troops were sick, and yet through strategy and through the technical skill of English longbowmen, archers, Henry was able to prevail. This is in the movie The King. This is the one with Timothy Chalamet and Robert Pattinson. So if you want to catch up on that, you can watch that. Although the battle does not go in the same way in the movies, but that's something I think we could always expect. Eventually, Henry V was so successful in France that he was proclaimed king, at least by some people, the king of France and England. He was married to Catherine of Valois to kind of solidify this, and they had a son who was meant to be the heir to both of these kingdoms. Of course, what happened was not as straightforward as that. The French were not going to accept that easily. And to make matters more complicated, Henry died, leaving his son on the throne of both of these kingdoms, at least ostensibly, at the age of only about 10 months. So Henry VI came to the throne as a baby in 1422. He ruled until 1461, but we kind of have to use the word ruled in quotation marks because Henry, although he was raised in the court, he was raised as king much like Richard, Henry was not super into it. He didn't really want to be king. He kind of just wanted to be left alone and read books. He was also afflicted with mental illness from his French side of the family, which was debilitating at certain points during his reign. And this was a big part of the impetus for the Wars of the Roses. So Henry VI came to the throne through the line of John of Gaunt, as we mentioned, who was Duke of Lancaster. So he is the Lancastrian king. And he was married to Margaret of Anjou, who you've heard at least on a few of my podcasts, who was a very strong woman who was really keeping things together as best she could when Henry was having his bouts of mental illness. But Henry lost most of France 
over the course of his reign. And he also ended up losing his kingship in England as well because he was not successful as a king. He was not super interested in being a king. And then he was debilitated by his illness, which left the door open for the York family to step in. So in 1461, Edward IV has become king of England. He is a Yorkist king. Henry VI is still alive, but he has been deposed. Edward IV is known as being very masculine, as having a whole lot of kids and marrying them very well, much to the delight of his wife, Elizabeth Woodville. She was an English woman. She was a widow. So this was a bad match, which he kind of snuck in there, much to the despair of some of the courtiers in England. But Edward was everything that Henry was not. So much like Henry IV replaced Richard and was that, you know, strong masculine king, Edward IV did the same. Because he wasn't always all that careful with his followers, he allowed things to get to the point at which Henry VI was placed back on the throne temporarily. And Edward IV was forced to flee. But, of course, Edward, being a tough guy... (laughs) Being well supported in England was able to come back and depose Henry again, at which point Henry VI was murdered in the Tower of London. People might hedge and say, was this because of Edward? Yes, absolutely. It was because of Edward, because as long as Henry VI was alive, whether he was a great king or not, he was a threat to the throne. Edward IV is also known for having executed his own brother, Clarence, in a vat of wine, so a vat of Malmsey wine for treason. So this was a very messy time, the Wars of the Roses, which is why so much ink has been spilled over the Wars of the Roses. So Edward eventually dies in 1483. Over the course of his reign, he had seen a lot of change in England, not only because of the Wars of the Roses, but also the printing press was brought to England in the 1470s. And some of the books that are first printed were in his name, or at least dedicated to him including Thomas Mallory's Mordacho. Succeeding Edward IV is his young son, age 13, Edward V. And there is not much to say about Edward V because he did not rule for very long. He was one of the princes in the tower. He and his brother were imprisoned in the tower and they disappeared. This is the mystery that is often laid at the feet of Richard III. Did Richard III murder the princes in the tower? Well, that's the million-dollar question. He certainly did not suffer because of it, but he was already campaigning for their illegitimacy because of the secret wedding of their father and mother. So is this just plausible deniability? I don't know. (laughs) I will leave this to the people who make this their life's work because there are very many people who spend their lives redeeming the reputation of Richard III. Now, as I mentioned last week in talking about Shakespeare, Richard was probably not the mustache-twirling villain that Shakespeare makes him out to be, especially because in the one portrait we have of Richard, he doesn't actually have a mustache, right? Okay, so maybe that's not the most compelling evidence. Richard III was the brother of Edward IV, the one that survived, unlike Clarence, and Richard was not expecting to be king. Did he plan to be king? This is, again, a really big question. I think when he got there, he really wanted to do his best at kingship, but he didn't have much time as a king. He was only king from 1483 to 1485. So he fought to get there, but once he was there, it was always chaos. No one truly supported him. He was also under suspicion for the murder of the princes in the tower, so things did not go all that well. And as a York, he had one of the claims to kingship. But on the other hand, there was a Lancaster who had a claim to the throne as well through Margaret Beaufort, and that was Henry Tudor. So Richard didn't stay on the throne very long. We know him as the king who was found under the car park. He did have scoliosis, and he was killed in a particularly brutal fashion at the Battle of Bosworth. And As we know from his body being kind of rediscovered under a parking lot, he didn't get a dignified burial as a king. At the Battle of Bosworth, it was Henry Tudor who became the king and the last medieval monarch, at least in my reckoning. 
So Henry spent a lot of time on the continent being kept safe from the Wars of the Roses. He was able to amass a big enough army to come back and defeat Richard III. And wisely, whether it was his idea or the idea of his advisors, he married Elizabeth of York, the daughter of Edward IV, and brought together the two houses, Lancaster and York, which is a very smart idea because then you have a lot fewer rivals to the throne. Henry Tudor was the father of Arthur, who never made it to the throne, and Henry VIII, the notorious Henry VIII. So this is around 1500. Henry VII ruled from 1485 to 1509. And at this point, I think culture shifts enough that I call this the end of the Middle Ages. So we end things with Henry Tudor. So I hope you've enjoyed this whirlwind tour through the medieval kings of England, at least by my reckoning, since the conquest. And maybe it's been useful to you, at least I hope so, in seeing these kings kind of one after the other, how the influence of their fathers and grandfathers may have shaped their kingship. They may sometimes be kings in reaction to their dads and sometimes in the shape of their dads or in the footsteps of their dads. There's probably a whole lot that Freudians can say about the relationship between fathers and sons, especially on the English throne. Either way, there is a whole lot of really interesting history that happened over this period, which is what keeps me compelled, right? keeps me doing this podcast every week. And I hope that maybe as you watch the coronation of King Charles III, if you choose to do so, that you'll see some of the medieval bits in the ceremony that you'll see the way that church and state come together in the way that they did in the Middle Ages, that you'll see Henry III's vision for Westminster Abbey in the Gothic style as he was hoping it would turn out to be. I think Henry would be very pleased to see this coronation happening in Westminster Abbey in the beautiful building that he wanted it to be. Maybe you'll see that beautiful gold portrait of Richard II which often gets a close-up in royal things that are happening at Westminster Abbey. So I'm hoping that this will inspire you when you watch the coronation or just make you think about the ways in which history is shaped by individuals over the course of centuries. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, we have a new columnist. His name is Timur Khan, and he's writing on Central Asia in the Middle Ages. And I had him start off talking about Babur, the 16th century ruler that he's the founder of the Mughal dynasty that rules the Indian subcontinent. But the most interesting part about him is, is the autobiography he wrote. It's called the Babur Nama. This is really fascinating. It's one of the very earliest autobiographies we have out of the 16th century. And it's just a fascinating look at like a ruler is thinking about how to rule his subjects and his personal life and, you know, really weird things. He once pitted a rhinoceros against an elephant. Wow. That would have been something to see. It it didn't go well. Rhinoceros just ran away. (laughs) I'm relieved, actually. I don't really want to think about how that might have gone otherwise. Yeah, yeah, he was open for a big bloody battle, but nope. So we welcome Timor to our writing team. And I'm also working on a piece on a connection between Beowulf, the text Beowulf, and King Knut. So it seems like maybe Knut used it as like a royal ideology to help him with his conquest of Denmark in 1019. And that gives an interesting, well, like why it was particularly written at this time. Knut, trying to be a long lost distant relative of Beowulf. Wow. As far as I know, they didn't have any dragons or monsters in Denmark, but I mean, you got to pump yourself up somehow, right? That's right. That's right. Whatever, whatever it takes you to get that crown, right? So we have that. Plus we took a look at a couple of our older pieces about popular names in medieval England, one in the 13th century, one in the 16th century. So take a look at that uh, for some fun. If you're looking for baby names. (laughs) <laughs> baby names are always popular, right? Indeed, indeed. Especially if you want to be named William. <laughs> That's true. All right. Thanks, Peter, for stopping by. Thanks. As I mentioned last week, I'll be back in the virtual classroom again this month, teaching a course on my favorite century for Medievalist.net. I'm calling it Calamity and Change, an introduction to the 14th century. 
In this course, you'll spend an hour and a half with me live each week for five weeks discussing the Black Death, the Hundred Years' War, the Peasants' Revolt, and some of the most beautiful art and literature created in the midst of all the turmoil. Whether you're new to medieval studies or a comfortable armchair historian, I hope you'll join me for a fun ride through a calamitous time. For more information, check out medievalstudies.thinkific.com. Class begins May 19th. And this week on my new podcast, Extra Medieval, I'll be talking about some interesting medieval coronations as well as why it raised eyebrows when the current King Charles chose his name. Extra Medieval is a show I've created just for subscribers where I get to expand on the topics covered on the Medieval podcast, as well as tell you about new articles, historical tidbits, and even modern research. Join me for Extra Medieval on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Patreon. And speaking of Patreon, a special thanks goes out as every week to everyone who supports this podcast as well as other indie podcasters and historians through Medievalist.net's Patreon page. Patrons can access all sorts of awesome stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, as well as ad-free versions of this podcast and Extra Medieval. To get in on all the action, please visit patreon.com slash medievalist. For everything from coronations to celebrations, follow medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can find me, Danielle Sabolsky, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a fantastic day. (laughs) 